Well, good evening and welcome to our service here in Chartridge on this Sunday, this Lord's Day, which for many is the key, the, 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 the um, pinnacle, the Sunday when we particularly remember that the Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and ever lives to intercede for us, ever lives as our Lord, our Saviour and our soon coming King. And now Christine will come and give us the reading. John chapter 20, beginning at verse 11, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he has said these things to her. Jesus appears to the disciples. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace, be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The death, resurrection, of the Lord Jesus occupy the greater part, the main sections of each of the four Gospels. But John, as usual, is not quite the same as the Synoptics. John gives us some insights, some greater detail that they don't. And when we look at John chapter 20, we didn't read all of it, and we missed out the first few verses, which speak on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene coming to the tomb early while it was still dark. Mary loved Jesus. There's a lot of hype about Mary, about her previous sinful life and so on, which we're not actually told in Scripture. What we are told, though, is the Lord Jesus cast seven demons out of her. She was one who Satan had a strong hold over. And as Jesus himself said, he or she who's forgiven much, that's the person who will love much. And we see Mary per person who knew that she'd been delivered. That's what salvation means, deliverance. She'd been delivered from the power, the very present and 
a, a power and recognition of Satan. And she loved the Lord Jesus. She was the last one to leave the cross. She was the first one at the tomb. She didn't wait for daybreak. She was there while it was still dark. She wanted to be there. What did she expect to see? A closed tomb. She expected to go there. She just wanted to be as close as she could be to her Lord, even though she'd watched him die and taken off and been taken off to be buried. But we find that Simon, that Peter, Simon Peter and John appeared. And they were going towards the tomb. And they stooped, they looked in. And they saw the, t the linen cloths lying there, but not the Lord Jesus. We find that Peter went in the, to the tomb first. The other disciple, who we believe to be John himself, had reached the tomb first. He went in. He saw and believed. And here's a key verse, verse 9. For as yet they didn't understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. The apostles had, for the six months prior to the betrayal and crucifixion of the Lord, had been taught, starting up in Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus started his slow descent down to Jerusalem. He told them over and over that he had to go to Jerusalem and why it was necessary that he should go to Jerusalem. That he was going to be betrayed, rejected, falsely accused. He was going to be killed. And on the third day, he was going to rise again. But they didn't get it. They didn't believe it. Like those two of the wider group of disciples on the Emmaus Road, their hopes had gone. Desolation, despondency. But they left. Mary stead, stayed. And Mary stood weeping. Weeping is mentioned several times in the first section. We're going to look basically on, th uh, in particular, at three of the characters, or three, or three characters or groups of characters in this story. First of all, Mary. Then the disciples. And then Thomas. And we're going to see how the resurrection had an impact on each of them. Mary, first of all, Mary being a woman, was more emotional, felt things more than the men. They left. Mary remained. She couldn't bear to leave. She was weeping. And we're told, verse 11, she was weeping. And as she wept, she saw two angels. She stooped and she looked into the tomb. She saw two angels that presumably Peter and John hadn't seen because the angels, of course, aren't human. They can appear in the form of humans. They can disappear. But these angels appeared to her and they asked, woman, why are you? It's there again. Why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? What did she say? They've taken away my Lord. She couldn't understand it. She thought they couldn't even leave him where he was to rest in the tomb. They, 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 she thought it had been desecrated. And that just added to her grief. They've taken him away. Notice, my Lord. And I don't know where they've laid him. But then she turned round. And wonderful moment, she saw Jesus standing, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Some commentators say humanly because she was looking through such a, an emotional lot of tears and grief that she didn't recognise him. I think it's a bit more like the disciples on the Emmaus Road. None of us, nobody recognises the Lord Jesus till he chooses to reveal himself. And so she didn't recognise the one she'd gone to mourn, the one who had broken her heart. And she saw him standing. She didn't know it was Jesus. And then this is the wonderful bit. Jesus said to her, I love the old hymn I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down, lay down, O weary one, thy head upon my breast. And the response, the response, brothers and sisters, if you know the Lord Jesus, 
To those of you who are watching a recording somewhere on one of the platforms this goes out on, anywhere in the world, you can see me, I can't see you. But have you heard the voice of Jesus speaking to you? Have we heard the voice of Jesus speaking to us, calling us by name? First of all, he says, first of all, he turns around and he calls her woman. He's working on her now. He's building up her faith, her recognition. Woman, why are you weeping? You see the emphasis on her grief, her human grief. This is what I love about the scriptures. They give the true weakness of humanity. They give it warts and all. They're not, it's not airbrushed. It's not all the way we write about heroes and we think that they were perfect. We see human weakness, but we see how the Lord Jesus deals with that. Whom are you seeking? She thought he was just a gardener. She said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him. And I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. That was it. It's not just that Jesus calls us. Jesus calls us by name. Back in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 43. But now, thus says the Lord, verse 1. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are are mine the Lord Jesus in John 10 when he called himself the I am the good shepherd the I am literally in the Greek ego I me I I am I myself I am taking the covenant name of God saying I am God basically and I as God I as deity am the good shepherd and what does the good shepherd do the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. But what do the sheep do? My sheep hear my voice personally, individually. People are not converted en masse. The gate's narrow. The way's hard and difficult. We enter it individually, one by one. This Easter, this Easter, have you heard the voice of the risen Jesus calling you? By name. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No, the Lord Jesus here, bearing with Mary, turns around and she recognised his voice and she said in Aramaic, Rabboni, teacher. But it's much stronger than just rabbi, teacher. There's a kind of personal, it's my teacher. She'd already said they've taken away my Lord. Jesus said, don't cling to me. For I've not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father, your Father, to my God and your God. The Lord Jesus here commissions her. He says, Mary, don't, don't just hang on to me. I've got work for you to do. I've got work for you to do. You see... Jesus drives away our tears. Jesus turns our mourning into rejoicing, our sorrow to joy. The, the sorrows of this life, the sorrows of this world. We live in a world that, where there are torments, there are tribulations. Jesus said you're going to have them. So we go through major disappointments. We live in a sinful, fallen world. A world that's under the curse of, of sin and God's judgment. And we're party to that. But in it all and through it, the Lord Jesus carries us. He brings us. The Lord, our good shepherd, takes us through the valley of the shadow of death. And promises to always be with us. No, where Mary was concerned, meeting, hearing, seeing the first, the risen Lord Jesus. She was the first person who saw the Lord Jesus. And he commissioned her. She said, go, go, go and tell my brothers. Go and tell, go and be witnesses. She went and announced to the disciples. <laughs> she wouldn't just say, guess what, guys? I've seen the Lord. Our translations say she announced. It's strong, isn't it? Can you imagine? She couldn't wait to get there. 
It's like those two disciples on the Emmaus Road of Luke 24. I bet you they went much faster on the last bit and they couldn't wait to tell. They couldn't wait to testify. They'd seen, they'd recognised the risen Lord. He'd revealed himself in them and to them. I've seen the Lord. And she testified to what he had told her. Secondly, we find that the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors were locked. The disciples were hiding away. For them, it wasn't tears. It was fears. They were scared stiff because those of you who know your Old Testament will know that when a king, when an army was defeated, his family, anybody closely associated with him was executed to so there couldn't be any rebellion. There couldn't be any, any whatever. They would expect that their leader, their leader having been crucified as an insurrectionist and a, terror, uh, and a terrorist and a threat to the Roman Empire, that they'd be coming for them. They were hiding away. They'd locked doors. They were scared stiff. They were f- afraid of the Jews. And what happened? Jesus came and stood among them. And he banished their fear. First of all, he drove away, he banished Mary's tears. Now he banished their fears. How? By saying, peace be with you. It's amazing how many times in scripture we find that said, peace be with you. With you. Remember, Jesus has said, My peace I leave with you. It's not like the peace the world gives. It's not a pat on the head. It's never mind, look on the bright side. Things will only get better. Ignore your troubles, put them in your old kit bag, whatever. Pretend they don't exist. No, says Jesus, I give you real peace. When we meet with, or when Jesus rather meets with us and reveals himself to us and in us. Then as an inner peace, we can go through the greatest storm, the greatest trial. We can't explain that peace. The peace of God passes human understanding. An old Scotsman once said, it's better telt, felt than telt. I'm not going to try and put on a Scottish accent. It would sound absolutely awful. But you get the point. You have to experience to know. And when you know, you want to share it with others. And say, peace be with you. And he showed them his hands and his side. And then, what's the third thing? I wanted one that right. If you wanted one that rhymes with tears and fears, I put cheers. Because look what happened. He showed them his hands and sighs. He told them peace. Then the disciples were glad. They had cheer. They were cheerful. Suddenly, their fears had gone. Suddenly, their devastation that their Lord, their master, the one who they would, might have felt human, they'd committed three years. They'd given up everything. They'd left the businesses. They'd left the homes. They'd left the families to follow Jesus. They would have lived with him. They would have walked with him. They would have heard him. They'd have seen what he did, heard what he said. And he'd gone. And it seemed the end. And now suddenly, fear has been turned to cheer. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. You see how he repeats this. That peace of God. That passes human stand. Peace be with you. And again, there's commissioning. It's not peace be with you. Sit and have a little party. Sit away now. Keep this to yourselves. Share it with others wherever you have opportunity. The same as Mary was sent. They're sent. As the Father sent me, even so I am sending you. And he empowered them with the Holy Spirit and, and told them, sent them off. They were commissioned. They were to be his witnesses. And brothers and sisters, if you know the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, you, all of us, are witnesses. Not all of us are called called to lead churches, to stand in pulpits, to preach and teach. Some, it might just be one-to-one, family, neighbours, work colleagues. 
It might be in, in, in smaller groups and Bible studies, neighborhood Bible studies, whatever. But wherever the Lord gives opportunity, ask him to use you. Ask him to make you a witness. But we find one of the 12, the 11 who were left, of course, Judas had, had gone before the, the crucifixion. But one of the original 12, Thomas, wasn't with them when Jesus came. It's interesting, J.C. Ryle, the 19th century Anglican minister and um, first bishop of Liverpool, a godly man, a man who I feel was to the Anglicans what um, Spurgeon was to the Baptists, well worth getting hold of his writings, well worth listening to them or reading them. And he on this, he says, why wasn't Thomas there? Why wasn't Thomas with God's people? When we're not with the Lord's people, when we forsake meeting with the Lord's people, we can miss out on the blessing. Thomas, for an extra eight days, went without that assurance of knowing that the Lord Jesus had, had risen from the dead, that he had risen again. We don't know why Thomas was missing. For whatever reason, he wasn't with them. And he missed the blessing of Jesus appearing and imparting his peace to them. But the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. And what's his reaction? His reaction's alarming, really, isn't it? Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and unless I place my fingers into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Oh, Thomas. Oh, Thomas. You, like the others, have been with the Lord Jesus, just as they had. You'd seen, you'd heard, you'd witnessed. Where's your faith? But here we see how Jesus is kind. How Jesus bears with our weaknesses. He knows that we are weak. I love Psalm 103, where we find that God doesn't deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities, for he knows our frame. In fact, verse 13 of Psalm 103, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He knows our weakness, our human weakness. He remembers that we are dust. Remember the Lord Jesus, we're told in Hebrews, we have a great high priest. He's able to sympathise with us because he knows what it's like to have become a man. Though he was truly God and he never ceased to be 100% deity, 100% the son of God. Yet he was 100% human. He knew what it was to be hungry. He knew what it was to suffer. He knew what it was to be rejected and falsely accused. And he knows what it's like to be a man, a woman, a boy, and a girl. And see how gentle the Lord Jesus is with Thomas. Eight days later, the disciples are again, and Thomas is this time he's with them. The doors are locked. Jesus came. I wonder, did he come this second time primarily for Thomas? It reminds me as I stand here of the good shepherd. The shepherd who had a hundred sheep and one of them had gone. And he left the 99 and he goes to seek the one. Jesus was not going to write Thomas off. You might have said, Thomas, if that's your attitude, you've had it. I guess many of us would have done that. If we're honest, we'd have been indignant. We'd have been insulted. Thomas, how faithless. You said you're never going to believe unless you have the evidence. Well, I'm... I'm going to stoop. I'm going to come down to your level, the level of your weakness, and I'm going to let you do that. And so the Lord Jesus, who knew, of course, what Thomas had said, nothing that we say privately is hidden from him. We need to remember that. And every careless word is going to be called into judgment. It's going to be revealed before the judgment seat of Christ. And the Lord Jesus knew exactly what he'd said. But what does he do? First thing he says is, peace be with you. It's there again. 
And then he picks out, he singles out Thomas. You imagine him looking directly at Thomas. I wonder how Thomas felt. I wonder how Thomas felt. Ah, right. And then he says, put your finger here and see my hands. Put your hand and place it in my side. He knew exactly word for word what Thomas had said. He knows our inner thoughts. He knows why we say what we say. He knows what we're thinking. We can deceive our loved ones, the nearest and dearest to us. We cannot deceive the God who knows us. We cannot deceive the Lord Jesus who searches us and knows us through and through. Do not disbelieve, but believe. What did Thomas do? Thomas didn't say, okay, Lord, come a bit closer. Let me reach you. He didn't need that. But notice what he says. My Lord and my God. Thomas now here recognises that this is God the Son. He is the one he said he was. The one who taught them and, and taught the crowds often that he'd come from his father. That he and his father were one. Remember it was Thomas along with Philip who were in John 14, when the Lord Jesus told them he was going away, he was going to prepare a place, who queried it and said, show us the Father, how can we know? How can we know where you're going? And Jesus had said to them, I and the Father are one. And at least believe it, if your faith's so weak, you can't believe what I'm saying. Believe it because of the very works I do, the signs that I do. And so, surely this all flooded back into Thomas's memory. And now his Faith is restored. His unbelief, his weakness is gone. Jesus has come down to where he was. Isn't that encouraging? When we have times, when times when we begin to doubt, times when it seems we can't keep going, times when it seems we cry out, Lord, where are you? We cry for relief for some pain or some long-suffering thing. And there doesn't seem to be any answer. It seems as if the heavens are like grass. Yet, the Lord Jesus, God, is patient with us. And he came to Thomas. And he got an individual witness. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Yes, you see. The risen, resurrected Lord Jesus didn't just drive away. Didn't just remove Mary's tears didn't just remove the disciples' fears and give them cheers, cause them to rejoice. But he removed Thomas's doubts. I couldn't get one to, to rhyme. <laughs> if you can think of one, let me know afterwards. But Thomas, who doubted, the Lord Jesus came to him in his weakness and, and he says, have you believed because you've seen me? What about us? We've not seen the Lord Jesus in the flesh. But we've seen him by the eye, or we see him by the eye of faith. And Jesus said, blessed are those who haven't seen me, and yet have believed. My friends, have you believed? Are you continuing to believe? My friends, wherever you are watching this on a screen, or, or, on your phone, on a tablet, or a laptop or whatever you're watching it on, wherever you are, have you seen and believed? Have you understood that the Lord Jesus was God's Son who came into the world to die for sinners and that if we repent, if we believe and trust in him, recognise him as our Lord and God, our Lord, our Saviour, our Master, the one who calls us by name. Have we heard his voice? If you haven't, God's word tells us that you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me, not half-heartedly. Not when you're desperate. Not when you can't think of anything else to do as a last resort. When you seek me with your whole heart. May we this Easter be those who have sought the Lord and continue to seek him. Those who want to love him and to love him more. The old hymn that says, Lord, it is my chief complaint that my love's so weak and faint. Yet I love thee and adore. It's like Peter, wasn't it? When the Lord Jesus reinstated him after he'd 
committed the awful sin of denying his Lord and Saviour three times. And three times Jesus came to him personally and said to him, do you love me? And so the hymn writer says, but I love thee and adore. Oh, for grace to love thee more. May that be what we take away from this Easter, from this Easter Sunday, from this resurrection day, that our tears are taken away when we meet and when we see the Lord Jesus. Our fears are taken away. And we're glad. Our, we, we, we cheer or we're cheerful. And our doubts are taken away by faith. So we pray, Lord, increase our faith. And Lord, use me, even me. May I be a witness to testify that I have seen you, wherever you are, whoever you are, each one of us, we've seen the risen Lord. And he's met with us. We haven't seen him physically, but we've seen him by faith. He's spoken in our hearts. He said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. May that be our aim and our goal, to glorify him. Amen.